Welcome. Thank you for clicking through to this video where I explain how the primer bulb system works on the Briggs & Stratton Classic Sprint Quattro Series 400, 450 and 500. This is basically a shortened version of the full version I've got out there on how one of these carburettors works. And I've done this shorter version so that you can get straight to the point on how the primer system works. And the main reason I've done this, of course, is because if you can get an idea a knowledge base that is of how this primer system works then you can understand if when you have problems with these carburettors what's actually going wrong there and you can have a better respect if you like for them okay but what I need to explain now is that for the first few minutes of the video I will have to just point out some key areas of the carburettor and the fuel tank because if I don't do this then I can't really explain how this system works so for the first few minutes please bear with me and to be honest, after watching this video, you'll probably know more about how they work than your local dealership. So let's get stuck in. And before we go any further, let's just identify a few key areas here. There should be an air box there with the air filter in, which isn't shown. But ultimately, this is the air inlet. And this side here is the side that is attached to the engine. And then we've got the primer bulb here. And this is the fuel pickup pipe. And this is the main jet. But at the moment I'm showing it in an isolated capacity so let's show it here now and that's how it should look on the side of the machine. We'll have the air box at the top and the fuel tank at the bottom and let's imagine now we've got x-ray vision and we can see inside the fuel tank here. And we can still see there where the carburettor is attached to the fuel tank itself and we can see the fuel pickup pipe here protruding down into the fuel here which I've shown in red. We've got a very special gasket and diaphragm that are situated between the carburettor and the fuel tank. We can see here how the main jet protrudes down into the fuel tank. This has got a protective gauze, like a little metal gauze filter type thing. And it looks something like this, and it fits on the bottom there. The reason I haven't shown it is just to make things a little clearer. Now at the moment it looks like the bottom of this carburettor and the main jet and everything is just floating around there and it can't actually pick up any fuel but of course it does do and the way it does do is all about the clever shape of the fuel tank itself where the carburetor actually sits so let's take a look at the top of the actual fuel tank and we can see there where the carburetor sits that special silver area that face is a nice smooth specially machined area there that allows the gasket and the diaphragm between the carburetor and the fuel tank to create a seal. So let's see how the carburetor interacts then with this area on the fuel tank. So the fuel pickup pipe fits down this hole here and the main jet actually fits down into this little area here. It's not actually a hole that goes through the top of the fuel tank and into the fuel as with the fuel pickup. It's actually like a little reservoir there. And so the carburettor is orientated then on top of the fuel tank in this way. And sitting on top of this silver area here between the carburettor and the fuel tank is the diaphragm. And that goes on first and keeps contact then with this nice flat surface. And then the gasket goes on next on top of that. Although these are the original colours, this dark colour for the gasket and the diaphragm. Let's just for the sake of explanation here, just change the colour of the diaphragm and the gasket just so that we can see things a little more clearly to help explain things better. So there we go, we've got the gasket in brown and the diaphragm in green. And so we can see now then that the way this carburettor works is by using these special holes on top of the fuel tank. So this picture here doesn't actually show that. So what I'll do is I'll just go into an animated version here, a drawing, that will hopefully explain things. This of course is the carburetor body and underneath it here is the fuel pump area and, and this is part of the fuel tank itself. That of course is the primer bulb. This is the main jet here. In the drawing here we've got the gasket at the top and the diaphragm at the bottom as we explained earlier. Okay moving on to this area now and I think the best way to explain this area here because it could be a little complex is to zoom in so we can have a closer look. And as we've said, the green one's the diaphragm. And at this point here, there's a little valve flap. And this is designed to open and close accordingly to let fuel in or to block fuel. And I'll be going through that very shortly as well. So I'll just put that cross-sectional view of the valve flap into perspective with the real diaphragm. So there it is. That's how it looks on the actual diaphragm itself. And this fuel way here, this little fuel vein, 
is this part here on the actual carburetor, just to put that into perspective as well. One thing worth noting here is that when this valve flap operates, it operates downwards. So it's either up for closed or down for open. And there's another valve flap here in this corner, which operates the other way. So it would be up for open and down for closed. OK, so another very important area of the diaphragm is this centre part here. That's the pump part that just raises up and down. It expands in and out and acts like a pump. And that's actually this part of the diaphragm here. Well, if we could see through the diaphragm, let's just imagine we've got X-ray vision again. We'd see there that there's a spring and that spring is what's forcing down on that diaphragm, pushing it downwards. It's this spring here. And as I've tried to explain there, anything in blue is part of the carburetor body and anything black is part of the fuel tank body. So that means then that this actual compartment underneath isn't actually anything to do with the carburetor other than the fact that the carburetor uses it. So it is part of how the fuel tank is built and the way it's built, it works complementary to the carburetor. We can see there that this cross-sectional view here of this compartment is actually this compartment here. We're looking down on it. Just imagining that this carburetor has never been used before, so there's no fuel in it anywhere. There would be air here behind the primer bulb. So let's just take a look behind there. It would look something like this. We can see that there's just air in there. Those little blue dots I've included there are representing air that's just sitting there, not doing anything, just hanging around. And let's have a look now at what it looks like when we've pressed the primer bulb. So there we are. And immediately you can see by the blue arrows there representing air being pushed or forced out into that little tube there and out from behind the primer bulb. Now you'll notice that there's a hole here as well and some air may well go down here but because this is the path of least resistance if you like this is the biggest hole most of the air will go this way. I will be explaining shortly what this hole does. It's basically a primer hole to inject fuel into the carburetor itself. But if we imagine that the fuel takes this route here and it travels down this fuel vein and then when it gets to this crossing point here it tends to take this route downwards. Now I realise by the way I've structured these fuel ways here in this T-shape that it looks like the air would keep going and down into the fuel tank. But this is the best way I could structure it to show my point. There would actually be some turns there allowing the air to actually come this way in priority. And therefore most of it reaching the fuel pump area down here. So of course, as I've shown here, as the air comes down out of this pipe here, it actually pushes this valve flap down off its seat, allowing the air to go past it and into the fuel pump area. And just to reiterate, that hole where the air is coming out of there is this hole here on the carburetor. And if we put the diaphragm in place there, we can see the valve flap there that the air has pushed open. So something like this, the air has gently lifted that flap and allowed a flow through. And so now we've got a flow through, that air continues to go down here and it will take this route. But if we look at this first compartment here, we can see that that's part of the fuel tank itself again. It's this area here of the fuel tank. And if you look closely there inside that little compartment on the tank, you'll see a little fuel hole and it goes right through and out here. So that's a constant through road, if you like, and that's this area here. That's these two areas that have animated. So the air travels through this hole and it continues on past the fuel pump diaphragm here. Again, this recess here that the fuel pump diaphragm expands into is this area here on the fuel tank. And so the air continues on through another hole here. And that's this hole here, as you can see, and that comes out there. So that's a constant through road as well for the air. And as we can see there, as it does come out of that hole, it lifts the valve flap there off its seat, allowing the air to flow through again. And it flows right round and down this area here that surrounds the main jet on the carb body. This is the area earlier that I explained was a little reservoir here on top of the fuel tank. So just to be clear, this is the main jet that I've drawn. That's this part here on the carburetor. And this area here is that little reservoir I was talking about that the main jet slots into, which is there on the fuel tank. Now, it, just at the side of this reservoir here, there's a little hole. And when the engine's running and there's fuel filling this little reservoir, that hole is like a relief area. So that if too much fuel goes in there, it can be relieved through that hole that drops back down to the fuel in the fuel tank then. 
So just to summarise so far, one press of the primer bulb has sent all of that air behind it down, down this fuel way here and down towards the fuel pump diaphragm through the valve flap there and actually into the fuel pump area. And when it gets down here, the pressure of the air might well not allow this diaphragm to sit down like this. It might actually force it up, but the air keeps going and out through the other valve flap here. And then, of course, it travels right round and then it surrounds the main jet here. Any excess when it comes to fuel or air will leave this area here back into the fuel tank. So this is what happens whilst the primer bulb's pressed. Let's have a look at what happens now in there, how the changes occur when we let go of the primer bulb, allowing it to expand backwards. OK, so let's imagine we've let go of it and it's now coming back towards us. Instantly, we can see there's a change there in direction of air. Essentially, what it's done is created a vacuum behind it and it's drawing up here on this fuel feed pipe. And ideally, it would like to draw up from this pipe as well. But as soon as it's doing that, as soon as it tries to draw there, what it does is it pulls that valve flap underneath it up fast on its seat. So we can't draw any air from there. So it can only come from this pipe here. And so that air movement through the fuel vein there to the back of the primer bulb because of that vacuum draws behind it and creates a suction, pulling the fuel out of the fuel tank up and filling this fuel pipe here. So we'll come in closer again. That vacuum there, because the bulb's expanding outwards, is pulling it even further now, that fuel, and it's all going up into the back there of the primer bulb. And it's starting to fill that area. And just quickly, that's why it's vital that these primer bulbs are in good order with, with these types of machines. If there's any, even a tiny little pinprick of a hole in there, we won't be able to create that vacuum to draw that fuel up. And sometimes when people have stored these lawnmowers away with these engines on, these primer bulbs sometimes get bitten by mice in garages etc and little holes appear and sometimes they can degrade over time. That's why we always have to make sure that we always replace these primer bulbs as soon as we see that problem and ensure that there's a seal here on the outer bit so that we don't draw any air in when that bulb expands as otherwise it, th there's no way we can get these machines going. OK, so the primer bulb's now expanded right back out now so it can't expand out any further. And we've got this pipe here now, of course, full of fuel. And it won't fall back down to tank that way because inside the primer bulb there's still a vacuum there stopping that fuel from going back that way. But it isn't quite full yet, so we'll have to press the primer bulb again. OK, so there we go, we've pressed it. And this time, because there's air and fuel behind this primer bulb, we've got that air and fuel going in together into this fuel pipe here. And again, that's purely because there was both air and fuel already behind the primer bulb and they've been forced out together. That's the only reason. But that pressure from the primer bulb has sent that air and fuel this way. And again, some may go this way down towards the tank, but the majority of all that mixture goes this way down here, down to the diaphragm, through the valve flap here and into the fuel pump area. And of course, the pressure of this mixture coming down here is forcing all of that air in front of it out through these little areas here, up through the valve flap and down and out this way so that we've, we can have a constant through road. So there's no build up. OK, so let's now imagine that the primer bulb is right in. We can't push it in any further. So now we must let go and allow it to draw back again. And as it does so this time, it fills the back of the primer bulb because the last time we pressed the primer bulb, we forced out all of the air from behind it. And so now it's expanded. It's pulled that fuel up from the fuel tank up the pickup pipe here and filled the back there. So there's just fuel in the back of the primer bulb now. And what fuel was forced down here on the last press stays down here because this valve flap is forced back up onto its seat because of the suction pressure there. And this, of course, allows for no fuel to go back that way. So let's imagine now that the primer bulb has come right out again, so it can't come out any further. So now we press it again and immediately we can see that the fuel has changed direction again. Now, when the primer bulb's pressed, it takes a greater amount of force to force the fuel out through this little hole than it did when it was air. Now, because air is thinner, remember, it can easily be forced down this little tiny hole here this fuel hole. The molecules are so small they haven't got to be backed up in order to wait to be forced out if you like. So although there's this hole here as we mentioned earlier 
because this hole is bigger than this hole then this is the path of least resistance for the air and it was easy to go down this path much easier than it was the smaller hole so that's why it took this route but now there's fuel in there and fuel is much thicker than air and it takes much greater force to force that fuel out of this little hole here then it will look for other routes as well and the pressure will pressurize it through this route here and the fuel leaving this area here is responsible for that extra bit of neat fuel required to start the engine so that's forced straight into the carburetor's inlet where it awaits engine starting so we know now that some fuel goes this way but the majority goes this way and it might well go down to the fuel tank as I've said but the majority of the fuel and the way these pipes are designed means it goes this way again I know I'm going over things again here but I just want to get this point across properly and again the inflow of fuel forces the valve flap off its seat here now the pressure of this fuel coming into this area does move the diaphragm up I know I've illustrated it as up but it will be down slightly before the pressure comes in and then it will move that diaphragm up it'll go against the spring there because the fuel can't all get through this area here under the diaphragm quick enough and so a slight pressure will build up there inside of there which lifts that diaphragm slightly but whether the diaphragm's up down or intermediate the fuel travels this way and it goes up and pushes the valve flap open there and then flows down there to start to fill the reservoir and surround the main jet here and of course as it flows through all the air that occupied this space is now being pushed out by the fuel through this area here and what I'm trying to say there is that the fuel's got a constant through road if you like to flow into okay we've got to that stage again where the primer bulbs right in we can't push it in any further so now we let go and like before as the bulb expands it's drawing in fuel behind it and filling it in the usual way now you'd think that the vacuum created by the expansion of the primer bulb would draw the air back this way from out of the inlet of the carburetor but it doesn't do that because this hole here is also a one-way valve so only starter fuel can go through there but nothing can come backwards okay moving on so the primer bulbs right back now and it can't come back any further so now we press it again and some of the fuel of course has gone this way to help start the engine and most of the fuel has gone this way and took the usual route round and under and round again and it's filled this area here which of course we know is the reservoir for the main jet and any excess fuel that comes into this area leaves through this escape hole here and falls back down to join the rest of the fuel in the fuel tank and so now when we press the bulb and let go we know what's happening inside there so the moral of the story now is we can consider this carburetor primed because we've got fuel up to all of these areas here where it's needed now we can look at starting the engine and just to give an explanation as to why there's a fuel gap here when the primer bulbs right out and everything's sitting still in there the fuel that was just above this area here will have fell out down here through the escape hole and gone back down to tank but that has no bearing whatsoever of the fuel that's in this area so the fuel that's left down here is then now available for the main jet to use when the engine started so just for a very quick summary we press the primer bulb and let go fuel comes up this way and then when that's full we press the primer bulb again and fuels force down this way and then ultimately the fuel flows into here to be available for the main jet for when the engine starts so that's how the primer system works then on this type of carburetor thank you so much for watching this video and if you want to know how the full system the full carburetor works on this i do have a video please check it out thanks again see you soon